Hey everyone, um, good evening. Uh, welcome tonight. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Spencer Rukti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Uh, on behalf of the store, I am very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with uh, America's favorite dad, Kristen Arnett, who is here to talk about her new novel, With Teeth, um, in conversation with Dantiel W. Moniz. Um, through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books continues to connect readers with authors <clears throat> in an intimate setting. Uh, we sorely miss having uh, authors and you in the store, but at the time, uh, at the same time, we're very thankful to have this platform that brings our growing event series into your homes all across the world. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting independent bookstores. Uh, coming up on our virtual events calendar, we have uh, legendary chef and food activist Alice Waters in conversation with Eric Schlosser on June 11th. TJ Kloon of um, the House in the Cerulean Sea fame, who is coming at the end of July, and so much more. Uh, you can find our full event calendar on our website at thirdplacebooks.com, where I also definitely encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter. Um, that newsletter is the best way to find out about new author events and other major announcements as we return to hosting uh, events like this inside our stores at last. Um, in a couple minutes, uh, in the Zoom chat, I will be sharing a link to purchase tonight's featured book, uh, With Teeth, uh, which is just spectacular and powerfully written. Um, it's going to surprise you and delight you, and I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, if you're in the Seattle area, you can actually order online and pick up <clears throat> in our store, or you can just swing by any one of our locations at Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park. Um, we're happily open to the public right now and love seeing you in person, but if you're not local, we also ship all across the country. Um, overall, thank you so much for your purchases during this virtual era. Uh, it's strictly because of you that this author series is even possible. Um, <clears throat> during tonight's event, I'd also like to remind you uh, that the chat window, which looks like some of you have found, is at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to use it tonight. Um, tonight, we'll also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for one of our authors this evening, please submit those in the Q&A window, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. And finally, as you may have experienced in some uh, virtual gatherings, uh, technical issues may arise. Uh, and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And, uh, but thank you for your patience and understanding. And now let's introduce tonight's speakers. Kristen Arnett is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, Mostly Dead Things, and the story collection Felt in the Jaw. Uh, a queer writer based in Florida, she has written for the New York Times, Guernica, McSweeney's, and elsewhere, and she has been a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award and a winner of the Ninth Letter Literary Award in Fiction and the Coil Book Award. Uh, if you haven't heard, Kristen has a new work on the horizon coming out from Riverhead, a novel called Samson and a short story collection uh, with foxes, which we're very excited about. Don T.L. W. Moniz is the author of Milk Blood Heat, which uh, was an Indie Next pick, a Roxanne Gay audacious book club pick, and has been hailed as a must read by Time, Entertainment Weekly, and BuzzFeed, amongst many, many others. Uh, it's also a book we really love here at Third Place Books, um, and a staff fit pick from several of our booksellers, uh, one of which is Kelly Schrader, who writes that Dantiel's debut story collection is searing, gut-wrenching, and alive. Uh, Dantiel's work has appeared in Tin House, Harper's Bazaar, and the Paris Review, and she is the recent recipient of a Pushcart Prize. They're both here to talk about Kristen's new novel, With Teeth, which is out now from Riverhead Books. The Rumpus calls it a love letter to the lesbian Central Florida lifestyle, and oh, the Oprah Magazine writes, come for the wackiness and wonder of queer family dynamics, uh, stay for the poignant portraits of motherhood on the brink. Uh, but now before we bring our authors on stage, we have a special musical performance by Sadie Dupuis, who you may know from the rock band Speedy Ortiz, or from one of her solo records under the name Sad 13, such as Haunted Painting, which came out last year. Sadie is also a good literary steward. Um, she has great taste in books and is the author of a book of poetry called Mouthguard. Um, if you're not familiar with her music, you will be in a second. Um, so I'm gonna disappear from the screen here for a second. And here is Sadie Dupuis. In Speedy Ortiz and Sad 13. 
Hi, my name is Sadie Dupuis. I play music in Speedy Ortiz and Sad 13. And I just happen to be a, a big fan of the best dad on the internet, Kristen Arnett. In fact, I'm wearing my my Kristen cosplay today uh, to play you a little song to introduce one of my very favorite new books, With Teeth. Um, I really loved this book for a lot of personal reasons, and as I was reading it, I thought, what song could I possibly play to match the greatness of this book? I can't match it, but um, I did write this song, Oops, by Sad13, uh, for an album called Haunted Painting, and it was about the, the part of me that's like very quick to, to get to justice, to being like retributive when I'm, you know, a little bit evil, uh, kind of recognizing those vampirish parts of myself. So I thought it might be a, a good fit for this book, which I love very much and can't wait to, to learn more about with all of you. So thanks again, Kristen Arnett and Riverhead for having me tonight. And uh, here's Oops by Sad13, inspired by another favorite Floridian, Britney Spears. Decimate my life. What I 
thanks so much and thank you to Kristen for having me here on virtual tour and uh, I hope you've already bought your copy of With Teeth. I have already read it and read it to my dog. Have a great event. All right. Um, a huge thanks to Sadie. Um, uh, now I'll invite our authors to the state, take the stage. Uh, I hope all of you will buy a copy of With Teeth and read it to your dogs as well. Um, I'm going to disappear here, but I will be in the chat and watching from afar. So if you have any questions, uh, just holler at me. Um, please welcome Kristen Arnett and Dantiel W. Moniz. Hey! Oh my god. You're so yeah. cool, Kristen. Oh my God. Thank you, Sadie. Yes, I see in the chat people like, everybody buy Haunted Painting by Sad 13. That album rules. It's from that album. I am obsessed with everything Sadie does. I had a little fangirl tear when I found out that she was going to do that song for me for tour. <laughs> Yay. Very cool. Um, way cooler than just like, I'm reading. You're like, <laughs> I, was like I like that. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Um, all right, so let's get into what everyone is here to see, which is you talking about your fantastic book. Um, if you hear my dogs in the background, they just want to get in on the conversation, so it, it's all good. Don't be alarmed. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here with you to talk about your super duper gay, fuck yeah, Florida ass book. Like, this book was doing some of my favorite shit, which is like basically exploring the realness of what it means to be in a family and have to figure out how to be a person while you're in a relationship with other people who are also trying to figure out how to be people, right? And all of the failing that comes in with that. So right off the bat, I got to tell you, we need to talk about the beginning. Uh, <laughs> that was just such an explosive start or like an introduction to Sammy's life. You know, you have this attempted abduction. I don't think that's a spoiler to say that. Like you, if you flip into the first page, it's like right there. Um, so you have this attempted abduction, you have the visceral heat and grime and pure exhaustion that's layered over everything kind of in Sammy's life. You get this really physical like sensation of like what her life is in that moment. It kind of sets the tone for the rest of the book. So I'm wondering, is that the first beginning that came to you? Mm. Um. When I first started writing this book, no, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, it was a totally different book in that I was trying to write a book um, about um, Sammy and her relationship with her adult son, Samson. Mm -hmm. And I was, I started writing it and I wrote, I would say I wrote about like 40,000 words of um, yeah. this like, book that was like, oh, it's like Sammy who's like, her adult son, Samson, has moved back home with her. And I was like trying to tell the story from there. And as I was telling it, I just found myself like doing that thing we do sometimes when we're writing fiction, when we know we're writing the wrong thing or we like, we keep putting them back or they're talking about something that happened in the past. You keep going back into the past. You keep, it's flashback, it's a flashback, yeah. Or it's like, it's like, it's okay. Like, I definitely think it's like fun and good to touch on that stuff constantly. I mean, I'm a huge fan of it, like throughout any work I'm doing, but this felt like I was escaping so often into the past that I was like, once I was at that 40,000, like mark, I was like, I'm spending so much time in the past that I've obviously started this book in the wrong place. Yeah. So I scrapped it. I scrapped all like the 40,000 words of that. I'm like, okay, this isn't working. And I sat and like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave it alone for a little while. And if it's something I want to write about, I'll think about it. And as I was, as we do, right, like we're doing stuff, like we're taking a shower, mowing our stupid Florida lawn, or like drinking a <laughs> beer, or like hanging out with people, you just have this kind of weird moment of clarity where something kind like, of mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a... Yeah, you feel it kind of happen. And it, sometimes when we're with other people and it happen, it I feel like it looks really weird. <laughs> like, it's like one of those things where you just start looking like this like you you figure yes. out yes it's intrusive it's very intrusive and I feel like it it scares people sometimes so it was like a feeling of like oh shit like I saw in my head the scene of this I was like this is needs to go like not even back like it needs to go way back and I saw in my head the scene of like um this scene from the beginning of the book which is like a very close scene that happens very quickly wow. Um, of them you're like being, in it you're dropped right down in it yeah you know, like a moment like in the playground where it's like as quick as like 
something like that could happen, right? Where you look away for a minute and something is happening. I was at work at the library, like when that happened. And I think I was like working reference and I was just like, oh shit. Like I was writing down like really crazy notes for myself, like in like a stupid word doc that I like emailed to myself. And then like, I was like, when I went on break, I was like, okay, I'm taking like a real break today. And then I went and I just like, basically like word vomited the whole beginning of it into like, and it's essentially pretty much the same. Cause I was like, oh, this is where it is. Like, I was like, this is where this book starts. Um, because it felt really significant to me from a, a viewpoint of it's like, you immediately are dropped down into like Florida in this very specific way. Yeah. You're immediately dropped down into the relationship between the two of them, like Sammy and Samson. And you're immediately dropped down into like how Sammy feels about herself. Like not only as a person, but like as a mother. As a mom, yeah. Um, so it was like, it's a moment that like happens very quickly, but like, I feel like the crux point of that was that I was like, in this moment where, you know, like maybe a person would be like thinking like, oh, thank God we've averted this like horrible thing that maybe would have occurred, you know, like my child being abducted and something terrible happening to them, who even knows what. And her thought process isn't, oh, we've averted this. It's like, her thought process is, why did he want to go? Why with, did my son want to go? Why did my son want to leave me? Is it, and, the, and I was like, this is where it starts. And this is all the unpacking that I'm going to end up doing. And that's, and that's where it started for me in terms of like visually and relationship wise. And also this kind of like really internalized strangeness of like, I, I say this a lot, like in regards to this book and also just how I feel about stuff, but like everybody in a family being an unreliable narrator, I was like, this is like where it starts. And so much of it is like Sammy being like, she's our guide, very close up third through this book, but she's also like leading us in a lot of very interesting directions that aren't necessarily like maybe what's happening, but also feel very, very real to her. So like the start yeah. of this book felt like necessary. Once I, once I wrote that in, then the book kind of took off. I was like, this is where it needed to start. You know, it's like one of those things where it's like, when you don't start it in the right place, or it's not like, you're not touching the thing that you're supposed to be doing. It kind of sits in a weird space sometimes, but when you finally find that thing, it like, you're like, okay, here we go. And that's yeah. what it, Like the momentum's off. If you're not, it's like, or slight, you feel slightly out of tune or out of step with the story that you're trying to tell. And you're like trying to either catch up or slow down so you can find that sweet spot. And it's not happening until you get that that moment. So I'm really glad that that came. I mean, because for me, just that, that's the crux of the whole thing is like Sammy feeling like I don't feel like I'm good enough to anyone in my family. Who I am, what I am is not enough. And I don't know how to reclaim my enoughness or whatever it is that she's searching for. So like, yeah, but I'm always interested in beginnings because I know, you know, that it doesn't always like, you see a polished book on a shelf, and you're like, oh my God, this book just came out that way. And that's usually far from the case. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's really interesting to think about. So then on top of that, then I really want to talk to you a little bit about the title, because mm -hmm. for me, without even having read a single page or the summary or, summary or anything, for me, when I'm thinking with teeth, that automatically implies bite, right? Mm -hmm. And we and we obviously, there are some central events surrounding this image and, you know, that relate to the story and the characters and their relationships together. But like, even that aside, to say or do something with teeth implies a kind of a danger or uh, a slyness or some sort of um, duality, right? And so I'm thinking, I guess I was wondering, is that what came to you when you settled on this title or how did you come to say like, okay, this is the title? Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a good question because I am such a person that like titles first before I do anything. It's like, you know how we all like as writers have some kind of weird quirk. A little quirk, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, this is the only font I write in, or I do this kind of thing, or I don't outline, or I do like yeah. a spreadsheet or like whatever. Like definitely one of my weird quirks is that I have to have a title before I start working on anything. And so this was not the title of this book. Um, and I like the, I'd gone through edits with my editor, like Cal Morgan at Riverhead, and he like emailed me. And as soon as I opened the email, I was like, Oh no, he and I are going to have to have a come to Jesus about the title. Because <laughs> he was like, he was like, okay. Because originally the book had been called Samson. Okay. I was going to ask you, can you say what it is? Okay. It was Samson. That's what the book started off as. Like, that's how it felt to me. And so he was like, can I talk to you about this title? Like, here's my reasoning for why I like think you want to like, let's think of a different title. And I was like, 
stressed out, but also I was like, his reasoning felt sound to me. I was like, I'm not going to be a person who's going to be like on a weird high horse about like, no, no this, this is my time. Yeah. So I was like, okay. And I was like, well, I want to be the one to do it. It felt like I was like, um, in keeping with like the theme of this book, I was like, I'm naming my child. <laughs> right. So yeah. I was I was like, okay, like, let me, let me think about it. And so I came up with some stuff, like a funny story is that like, I kind of jokingly, but not jokingly kind of was like, what do you think about the title scissoring? Cause I thought that was funny. Um, he said, no, <laughs> I was swimming in the book. There's lesbians, but like, no, no, we were not doing scissoring, but this one kind of came to me like as I was just like thinking about it and I was like oh like okay so much of like the idea of this book is like a kind of like thinking about like a feralness mm. you were talking about or like the idea of like something kind of sinking its teeth in and like clinging or not letting go or like what what it looks like when there's like um a hold in that kind of way yeah. I mean, I mean, you know living in Florida too like so much of like what we encounter like not even with like with animals, sure. Like, I think you and I could both think of, like, lists, like, a number of things off the top of our head in our own yards that could yeah. bite us. That but, would be, like, yeah. But there's, like, this way in which I was really thinking about, like, um, the way in which, like, somebody, like, bears teeth. or yeah. um, And this idea of, like, the chaos of childhood, like, right? Like, children bite um that's just and that's a normal thing like there's not anything weird about that kids are like learning how to use their bodies in a kind of way where it's like right it's not just hands or feet or whatever it's like a whole body sensory experience which includes like a mouth yeah and so like when parents are encountering that um it's quite often in direct conflict with like that right so it, it felt appropriate to me in a lot of ways also the ways in which like people are unkind um or like when discomfort sits inside of something feels like it's with teeth so yeah. it, it felt right to me it felt like it felt like a very florida title um it also felt like um a very like um in in a kind of way of like danger or a kind yeah. of way the feralness that felt like significant but yeah it was weird because it was definitely not the title and that was like a strange like you know like something's titled in your head and then you just keep calling it that thing having to like sub, like switch my mind around to like figure out what it was called was like a strange thing but also very quickly became like oh absolutely this is what this book is supposed to be titled especially when they came up with like when Riverhead did this like beautiful artwork for the cover like it looks like perfect yes like, the cover and what's beneath the cover i don't know if you have if you've bought the book yet if you've had a chance to look but there's Kristen's initials are in teeth like on the cover of the book is very cool um yeah it's a very um like i said danger or like some sort of like duality but also it's, it's a sexy title you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. i don't know i think there's something there can be something sexy about teeth on top of the fact that biting you know what i mean like i do agree with you <laughs> like, okay Really, really digging this title. Um, staying with the the teeth, the biting. You know, there's this visceral scene where that th this image comes into play between Sammy and Samson, and they're locked together in this very like primal kind of embrace. And it was so interesting to me because it's like a moment where Sammy lies to her wife about what actually happens, but it's almost not a lie, right? It's it's an almost truth, as if she's saying to her son like. You did this to yourself by making me do this to you. And there's a lot of really interesting um, gaslighting and like, like you said, unreliable narrator things happening all throughout the book. And I hope we get to the last question that I want to ask you because like it comes back to that first moment of abduction. But I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about that moment in relation to the struggle between Sammy and Samson. That moment in the car is so important for their relationship going forward. Yeah, um, I that was like because I am a person that does not outline. I like to be surprised. I feel like if I'm not, if I know what I'm gonna write, I get bored like sometimes. So this was like a scene in which I was writing it, and I did not know what was gonna happen until I was in the middle of writing it, and it was one of those like, oh fuck, like she's gonna like bite her kid. Like yeah. okay, we're like we're going there. Like this is what's happening here. Um, but to me, in that moment. It became this thing that I heard um, that I, I feel like I haven't been able to think about very eloquently, but like um, Daniel Evans, I heard talk about this in like this very specific way that I was like, oh, this is like definitely how I think about 
these kinds of things like in scene, these like pivotal moments of like, like Danielle was talking about it in these ways in which like, when they reach like the for the kind of metaphorical fork in the road where they can make one decision and the life carries on runway and then they or they could make the other decision and it goes in this opposite direction and that's where the story really happens yeah. and that to me felt like very much sitting inside of that scene because it was like not from her choosing not to bite him but how she reacts to it like she doesn't choose to be like to her wife hey we just had a whole situation here can you pull the car over like I don't know what happened. I like, we need to like, actually very much need to like get to the therapist because I definitely bit. Yeah. Sam. I just did this yeah. thing and I don't know where it came from, but it happened. Yeah. yeah the situation in which she could have like a whole ass conversation about it and maybe address a bunch of stuff going on, or she can do a thing that she chooses to do, which is to be like, I can't let anyone know about this happening. This is something where it's like you and I are in a power struggle, which is a completely interesting idea to like think about between like a parent and child because the idea of like a power struggle like legitimately between somebody and a fourth grader is not real like that's like right. very much like manufactured in an adult's mind like a child yeah. doesn't have the wherewithal to be like in a legitimate power struggle with another adult so the fact that she decides to take that moment and have it be this kind of moment in which like she feels like she's won something there or like they're in like a uh, agreement about something is like I was like I feel like that tells us a lot about Sammy in oh, ways yeah. that maybe other things in the text like would not but like that in that moment how she chooses to react how she interprets things and internalizes them says like a lot about like how she views things in the context of her family and her relationship with her son so it felt like a very pivotal moment for me like even outside of the bite but like how she decides to like handle it because I think plenty of people get into situations where it's like like, I spent, like, I was, like, I spent, like, eight and a half years working at, like, a public library doing story time, and, like, watching, um, yeah, <laughs> watching, like, because it's, like, it's, it's completely, like, to be, like, very frank, like, it's, like, everybody has these, like, moments in which, like, things are going on in their life where they want to physically, like, hit something or someone or shake someone or like scream in their face or like do some kind of thing. And I think even when I was doing like stuff at story time, you could see like the parents who were like on the brink where they were like, something's happening and like, I would do anything to just like scream bloody murder right now or like do something, but those things don't happen or like they're not happening there in front of you anyway. Yeah, they're usually not happening in public, yeah. Yeah, so it's just like, okay, like, what does it look like in, in the, like, the closed context of this car, like, this kind of confined closed space and being like, this is the thing where it's like, it's happening, this is a thing that happens sometimes in, inside of families, we know that this kind of thing happens, but then, like, how does it, like, how is it parsed afterwards, like, how do, how is the people inside of the situation dealing with it, and how she chooses to deal with it, I was like, is, this is how the story is moving along, this is, like, how we're going to continue on, because it's, like, she's making very specific choices and that's going to inform like everything that happens from then on. Like, so I felt like that was like yeah. a very important kind of V in the road, like Danielle. Was Absolutely. It was also a moment where, you know, cause this whole time up until that point, she's thinking like, you know, I birthed my son and still, I don't feel like there's anything of me in him. You know, there's a similar similarity in their eyes, that kind of thing. But you know, he has her name, that kind of deal, but she's still kind of like, is he my son in this kind of way? And then that that bite kind of for her is like, oh, I've marked you. Now you're mine. Now we belong to each other. So it was a really interesting moment of violence, but there was also like a tenderness in there. It was also like you said, her being proud that she like won this moment, mm -hmm. even though it's super dysfunctional, but like families are often super dysfunctional. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> one to write about yeah 100%, <laughs> i'm 100% there with you um so now i feel like this is a natural segue to talk about um the capital q capital m queer mom right which is like the beating heart of this whole book and you had uh this line in the story that was basically like um aging out of queerness by deciding to like start a family mm -hmm. or deciding to become a parent or whatever so i'm thinking like already motherhood is like this role that can completely consume all of your other separate identities and I'm kind of wondering how how does the queerness come in and kind of like disintegrate like those identities further when we're talking about queer parenting in specific right because there's there's additional challenges when you're outside of the you know 
normal or like heteronormative roles. Yeah. I mean, there was like a lot here where I was thinking very much about like, what's it like to be living in Florida and being like, not just a parent, but a queer parent, because yeah. like something like I think about a lot um, is like this, the queer spaces that are available for like queer people. Like, and I write a specifically a lot about central Florida. So I'm writing like a lot about like Orlando, Orlando, like adjacent kind of areas. Yeah. Um, but I think we both know like Orlando is like a red state. So it's like when we're talking about like Florida is very disparate in terms of like what different areas are like, but overall we have the same kind of shitty kind of things happening in our government. 100%. And a lot of things that inform like the kind of things where it's like quote unquote like morality of place or like what's like allowable or like what, so what things you have access to. So in writing this book, I was thinking very much about like, because I am a person that likes to write about like the kind of like daily movement of queerness through space. Like I'm, not, I'm less interested in the big moments and more interested in like the kind of daily moments of like, right. Yeah, individual level, yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay, like, what's it like to be like, okay, I'm going to my job that I don't kind of love so much, and I happen to be queer, like, oh, I like, I'm kind of like pumping gas in my car, or like, and I don't like, you know, my car broke down, and I have to call someone, and oh, I'm queer, like, I was like, those moments of like, that are not necessarily huge, pivotal life moments, but are like, still define like the makeup of a life like that's what I like am the most interested in as a queer person who's like moving through the world that way that's the kind of thing I'm like the most interested in so like thinking about queer parenthood in Orlando specifically I was like there's like the queer spaces that are there are like not defined like I talked about this the other night like with somebody but it was like there's like two to three like night club like slash bar situations for queer people and it's like there's a ton of queer people that live in Orlando or like yeah. and the greater Orlando area is humongous so it's like you know it's it's a bunch of people like with theme parks and things like that so there's a ton of queer people but then like there's these kind of queer spaces that are technically queer like um places like I was I said this the other night there's like gay IHOP like we have gay IHOP where it's just like people who are gay work there and it's like management that's queer people are or yeah. queer queer people feel comfortable and like show up and like spend time there so like there's these spaces but then when you think about the idea of being like okay now I'm gonna have a child and I'm gonna like you know parse this with another person and we're kind of trying to understand like what our roles are and what that looks like and like also what it's like to raise a child and be like in a situation where like we're two women like we're two people who identify as women like there's not like a kind of way to look at that. There's no like, here's a blueprint. Not that like, I, I think that there's any kind of blueprint for parenthood necessarily. But like, if you're in a state like Florida and you have people that are like looking at you all the time, like being like, you're gonna like fail at this because this is like immoral in some kind of way. And so we know you're going to like, there's gonna be a fault in it. And then to be like trying to do that and also feel like you have a complete loss of community because there's just like, nobody there's no queer spaces that will allow for it and so like maybe the queer people in your life also don't know how to parse that yeah. and so, like you know like the, you don't have the support of that and maybe like I think that that happens even in friend groups all the time where it's like I don't know how to deal with this with what you're doing in your life and so I step back from you and like so to feel like that kind of loss especially with queer people or with so much of our community and family is like built um we've we build that ourselves and so then to not have that support would be like this kind of like really devastating kind of loneliness and then to top that off was like maybe you decide to do this and maybe you just kind of suck at it you know like maybe you're not good at it and maybe you figure out like in the middle of it this is not what I wanted and I'm not great at it and now I have zero support and also I don't really know what I'm doing you know um. And so I'm going to model it off of like what I see around me and the model I see around me is these like kind of heteronormative relationships that are kind of dysfunctional anyway, Super. right? And that don't work. <laughs> yeah. As so, modeled by our, you know, like our, you know, what's handed down to us. Yeah. So it definitely felt like, I don't know, that was something I wanted to write about where I was like, I, this isn't going to be a situation in which I'm writing about like, 
like queer mothers persevering. I was like, this is where I'm going to be like, I want to write into the struggle of this and, and see how it fails. Cause that felt like significant to me. And also I just get like, I, I like many of us, like many queer people are like, I don't want to see like, Oh, like the, here's like the, you get like a gold star for being like the best gay mom. Like you yeah. did. Like, I was just like, that's just not human. Like I was just like, yeah. it's what I want to see and I really want to like write about like the kind of ways in which we fail each other the kind of ways in which like you know maybe you try but maybe you fail and that was like that felt like deeply that feels deeply important to me in queer literature like I want to see people fucking up like I want to see the kind of mess and like underpinnings where it's like right where you flip the embroidery over and then you see what it actually looks like on the other side is like the stuff that I was like that I feel like is the most significant to me and I feel like if we're not allowed to process that or parse it in real time in front of people, then like, I just don't feel like that's, it's not fair. I mean, not that anything's yeah. fair, but it's like, that's, that's the thing I'm most interested in is like that kind of messy underside of it because that's- I'm hundred percent with you on that as somebody who writes about black womanhood and not having to write the, you know, the, oh, the bootstrap story or like, I'm, you know, persevering through system, you know, racism, all this stuff. Like it, it feels really good to see that kind of stuff being explored on the page. And I want to go further into it because we touched on it with the heteronormative roles there. You know, I think a lot of people like queers and straights alike have this idea that like, oh, a lesbian marriage would be inherently more feminist than in other types of marriages, right? Just based on the fact that it's two women. But like, as you can see, like if you read this book with Sammy and Monica, it's as if they're squeezing themselves into these conventional um, marriage roles, right? So you have Monica as the breadwinner and the fun parent, and then you have Sammy as a stay-at-home mom, and there's so much resentment flowing from both sides. And I think, you know, relatedly, there's this scene in the book near the beginning, you know, where Sammy's going through this kind of, like, mental cataloging of the dynamics of her family. And we see, we, we get the phrase, like, picture perfect, right? And it made me think of, like, it's, it's kind of like a red herring, that word, right? Because in a picture, you can never see what's going on outside of the frame. You can only see what people are trying to show you. And it made me think of like Instagram and like social media and these ways we curate our lives for other people to consume kind of. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, I guess I wondered what was this, what was calling to you about this illusion of normalcy uh, for these characters in particular? And what's the impact that these kind of dictated um, heteronormative structures have on, on up, upholding these kinds of scripts and families, right? All families, but especially queer families. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're totally right. I think like a way in which like we as like, I don't wanna say, as a society, as a society, the way in which we like parse the world a lot of the time is through this lens of social media, like, right? Like there's ways in which like we view other people like through something like Instagram, but it's also ways in which we present ourselves, yeah. right? Um, it's it's a curated kind of thing and it's purposeful and like we all do it like there's just like there's ways in which it's like we can recognize it or have some kind of like say about it but even us having a say about it becomes this kind of like still like Instagram kind of way in which oh. we're doing it and so I don't know like I think that there is this way in which it's like right we want to be viewed and I can imagine like like in writing these specific characters like yeah I have this like scene in which she's like the front there's like a birthday picture where it's like they're like it's like Sammy's birthday picture that it's like a really cute picture of the three of them at like a nice dinner for like Sammy's birthday and it's like Samson in the middle and her and Monica on either side and they're like celebrating it and like what you don't see is like what's going on under the table where it's like he's like kicking the shit out of her leg and like Monica is like just smile and like, take the picture take the picture take the picture and like like what it takes to kind of curate a moment like that where in reality like quite often like many of us are like in those kind of like scenes of chaos in in the before the the picture is actually taken so trying to like fit into these kind of like roles I think happens in this horrible kind of natural way because like what I mean natural is like not the right word right it's natural. yeah yeah it's, it's what we see presented in front of us and it's also like what many of us grew up around like right where it's like these kind of roles in which it's like you know oh well it's e it's easy to like let things slip into a place in which it's like well since I'm doing this you're doing this mm -hmm. and then yeah. And I, I think inside of households with any kind of family, no matter how your family is built, like what it looks like, if it's like, 
like any like what how we build families and like queer like in like you know queer communities like you know this is our family or this is like you know friends and everybody this is like how we be, build our space and there's ways in which we are very bad at boundaries with each other. Um, just because you're like a queer person doesn't mean you're doing what's right all the time. Um, and I think that there's like, it's a huge thing I think about a lot that is like very deeply messy in queerness, which is that like, like we're like, oh, well, thank God I'm gay or like we're queer, we're not like straight people. But there's so many ways in which we embody these like very terrible boundaries with each other. Um, and so thinking about like, um, the ways in which like in a household maybe like we let these kind of things which are kind of dysfunctional and like a little bit toxic like they start out a certain way and instead of addressing them in some kind of way that's healthy or like communicating properly we like allow them to go on and by allowing them to go on like they build on top of each other to a place where it's like it's not noticeable anymore so they're like patterns of behavior that continue until they reach a point like I mean within the book they reach a chaos point <laughs> yeah rather quickly yeah yeah but I think within like within any kind of like situations like that within friendships within all kinds of groups within like just relationships between people yeah. like you know parent and child like this is just like all kinds of stuff that's in the queer community that I think we don't I wish we talked about more in like very frank ways in which we like allow patterns of behavior to happen and so often or like kind of incorporated them into these kind of like queer cliche kind of things where we're like oh this is just what dykes do or oh this is just what queer people do and it's like no it's not and it's really bad that we like let people say that this is like how things are because that's how bad patterns like build up and we allow oh. things or we internalize things we're like well this is probably fine because it's like how like, normal yeah this is normal yeah and so like this like it felt important to me to really work that into this household because this is a household that's internalizing a lot of this stuff right where it's like my wife's the butch she goes out and she works and I'm like the femme of whatever that means of this relationship and I stay home and I raise our kid but also I don't like this and these roles aren't working and we don't have the framework to have a conversation about why this isn't working because how we're patterning everything is on a heteronormativity that doesn't work in terms of queerness. Yeah. It doesn't work for straight people either <laughs> you know what I mean like it doesn't work for anybody yeah uh, it's pretty awful. Um, so I just want to remind people to put a, if you have a question, we love questions, put them in the Q&A and I'll read them off. But I want to ask you one more question before I turn to the Q&A. I have so many questions that I'm, I'm still hoping to get to, but we'll see how it goes. But I want, before I go to the audience, I want to ask you a lot of things. And you talked about it just now a little bit, boundaries, right? And consent that comes up a lot in this book. I'm thinking most clearly about Sammy and the neighbor, what she calls checking on her friend and, and Sammy and the woman in the club at the line in the bathroom. You know, both of those occurrences felt like it was a way for Sammy to kind of center herself and to regain some of her sense of agency in her own life, but it was at the cost of someone else's agency. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about what your intentions were in writing those dynamics into the book. Yeah, um, both of those things felt like deeply significant to me, um, especially writing that um, scene into the, uh, like the, like the gay club night. Like yeah. I was like, feels important to me because I also think it's this way in which um there's like plenty of times that like a person that's in queerness I'll like include myself in this I think that people within like queer community can like say like well this is like how I've seen things done or here's how I'm seeing things right now and in that in, in that way we like allow like boundaries to like really blur in a kind of way like we allow for behavior that like shouldn't be allowed because we like allow like a lot of passes because we say like well they're queer and so this is a safe space but I have like a lot of questions about what safe spaces mean yeah. if it's like not including like these kind of ideas of like boundaries that are like allowing for everyone's agency and everyone's like personal sense of self where they're feeling respected um and I wanted that to be like it felt important to me because I think for Sammy, she has like, I mean, she is unreliable and she is this like narrator who has this like very specific idea about how she sees herself through the lens of nostalgia of how she saw herself before. Mm, yeah. Um, and I think that there's this way to, um, in which like many queer people go through this like kind of delayed kind of 
add a, not like delayed kind of sense of like understanding the self because so many of us like spend our formative years trying not to be the thing that we are. Like we're trying to accommodate and adapt into like how we feel like we should perform um, and in like this kind of like had like heterosexual kind of like way that we're like okay like I can't let anyone something's weird about me and I need to see a pattern behavior off of the people around me and then once we do have like some kind of reckoning or coming out process um it's like completely relearning everything and I feel like so many people go through this like deeply messy period like how it would be like being like young and like trying to figure out like I don't even know how to date. I don't know how to fuck anyone. I don't know like who I am. I don't even know what, what kind of like thing I want. It's like this kind of thing where it feels like very, very young and relearning. So then to move from there into spaces where it's like somebody like Sammy who feels like I finally learned who I am and now I feel like I have no fucking idea who I am. Um, I am lost and I am looking at like my previous self as like a way in which I could like try and understand like myself who I am now but it's like I also think like I'm very interested as a writer in using nostalgia in a way where it's like nostalgia is like people love it but it's also just horrible like it's a bad way to like experience like how things actually are yeah just like quite often like a way in which it lists, it's a weapon it's like a bad way to like process anything it's a way that people like wax poetic about situations that probably were not good in many circumstances is. Our country is a really prime example of all of that. Yes. <laughs> so it's like, I was like, okay, like for her to be like specifically in that club to be like, she can't even process the people of her own age around her. She only sees like people who are younger. Yeah. She's only processing it this way in which is like, remember when I was like that? I don't know how to act like that anymore. This is what I'm missing or what I want or like what I feel is lacking. And the ways in which she's like, she feels like she's owed like, the kind of things that she was like maybe something's been taken from her felt like important because I was like this is like a lot of ways in which many people press boundaries or like um are dysfunctional or toxic in ways that like they don't even recognize with yeah. other people unmaliciously um, unmaliciously yeah. yeah but it's still happening and it's like yeah. you have to it's like right like who who's the person that gets to tell you that and and then and then if I'm thinking about it in terms of like her being the voyeur of this woman who's in the house next door like what's it like to be like witnessing like a life that's like kind of like because it's not even a life she necessarily wants it just yeah. feels like an easy thing to see and I think lots of us are guilty about like looking at me like wouldn't it be like nice if this was like my my life and in the just that I didn't have to deal with like the xyz but her looking at that does not encompass like the entirety of that woman's life she literally knows nothing about that woman's life yeah. other than just looking at and seeing and in like small moments of like here's the yogurt she likes to eat and also her sink is clean and she doesn't have a kid here and like her house is like clean yeah like, she seems free right yeah. Um, and it's the same kind of way in which we, I think we kind of are voyeurs of social media. Like if, I mean, we all like, like, are like, oh, yeah, that's like, yeah. are, what's this relationship look like? How does that, like, I think her looking in the window is kind of like a more messed up version of kind of like Instagram, like, like looking Let me at check up on you. What you got going on? Where were you three years ago? Yeah. yeah. But like <laughs> that moment. Yeah. Um, Okay. So instead of asking you the question that I would like to ask you next, I'm going to check out the Q&A because we've got some questions in here. All right. Okay, we got to take the Florida question because, you know. Um, so Allie wants to know, how does the setting affect this book? Could this book have taken place anywhere else? Um, I think that is a great question. I think like anything I am writing, um, at least where I am as a writer right now, where I've been as a writer like, no, I don't feel like it could have, like, it felt important to me specifically for this book to write about, like, the kind of lack of spaces. Also, just, like, my previous book, like, writing Mostly Dead Things was, like, such an outside book, like, felt, like, so, like, completely, like, even when you were indoors, you felt like you were outdoors, and this, I wanted it to feel like the kind of claustrophobic, like, situation in which, like, many times people can find themselves in, especially, like, plenty of parents who are like in a situation where they're like my if they're a stay-at-home parent 
like can kind of turn into the situation where like my life is really revolving around what my child is doing, but it means I like don't have a kind of sense of who I am anymore. And also my time spent outside is like in a car, like, right. It's like, I like am transporting someone. Like, I feel like my service is like chauffeur at this point or like moving you from X to Y to Z. And like, what does my life look like outside of the circuit that I'm running? Um, and so much of that stuff um, for me feels like deeply felt in the kind of like ways in which like Florida revolves around it, right? Like. I feel Florida in it. I like I like the idea of the ways that like sometimes Florida like permeates the bubble. Yeah. Um, the ways in which like the kind of little bits of wildness like can poke in. And to me that feels like significant and it could be only be Florida, but also it's just is like I know Florida is like deeply significant. I know you know. I know you know. <laughs> it feels like it had to be. It feels like it very much is. Like that's where I feel like in my in terms of like my writing career is like Florida sits around me and inside of me and like kind of is like looking for ways in which to like right like the little potato vine to kind of weed its way into something. Wow. Looking for the kind of way in which to like nudge its way in which is like how I feel Florida is all the time it's always like this continual trying to take back of space like yeah it's right at the door it's wildness encroaching right there you know alligators in the retention pond right in front of your house or like whatever it is yeah um oh here we go anonymous wants to <laughs> wants to know uh if you had to choose just one what is your favorite beer you've ever had ever ever that's like so ever. so final ever Oh my god it's if it could be easier to choose like a favorite book like honestly this is like a hellacious question um like yep. if I, two seconds on the clock okay i like i, I honestly like to be perfectly frank my be, my favorite beer is still reserve which i know is not a beer it's like malt liquor it's wrong to say that <laughs> it's my favorite one i truly love it the best okay i mean it is what it is then that's what it is last <laughs> beer on the planet that's the one or malt liquor on the planet <laughs> um okay let's see oh i like this one another anonymous was there a trail of books that helped lead you toward writing this book i mean i think there's been like i feel like very lucky because i think right now there's so many people that are writing like really interesting fascinating like looks about like queerness and like how like parenthood sits inside of that um one that I was reading like after I was like did the draft and it was in terms of editing was pizza girl I love that fucking book yeah. um that came out like last March no. like that yeah yeah um it was like a book where it was really looking at queerness and like also like parenthood in a way that was like deeply messy but also just like really thinking about like this idea of like I don't know what I want but also I want a lot and I want like a lot of different things and that's like a way in which I was like I deeply relate to this I really relate to this so I feel like there's like a lot of stuff that's coming out like now there was like a book um that I read like maybe like a year before I started like even working on with teeth which was like a book called um baby teeth that came out which is also a book that has like it's titled teeth I really liked that book a lot it's a different kind of book but it's a woman who has like um like is having like a lot of like health issues in her own life and then has like a child and doesn't really know how to parse like how um her relationship with this child is and also her relationship with her significant other and, and plus her health issues and how like that makes her feel about herself as a person and I like I deeply internalized like what that was like because that's a, such a bodied book um I was thinking a lot about like the self as a body or this kind of idea of like perforation of the body and like feeling like um like what it feels like to have a child and feel like they have their hands in you or on you or like this idea of like inescapability of like the touch all the time I just feel like there's so many cool um books right now but like also I right, like detransition baby came out this like year that's like a fucking amazing interesting look about like what like queerness looks like and also parenthood or like what it means to like what a family looks like so I think like even like moving forward I'd be like really interested to see like I can't wait to see what kind of like messed up queer uh family books I can get my hands on is my is my hope <laughs> great goal. that's a great life goal I love that for you. Love that for all of us. 
Um, all right. So I think we have time. I'm going to try to get two questions in. There's a question in here that I was going to ask you anyway. So I feel like I get to cheat and go back to what I wanted to ask you. But uh, someone said throughout the book, several chapters end with a look into the thoughts of an otherwise background character from that chapter. What inspired, inspired you to include these vignettes? Um, it felt really important to me to have um, a perspective from outside the family um, in these moments small ones like like maybe like moments like glimpses in time yeah. because um it felt less important to me to have like Monica or Samson um speak because I like what I was like saying previously about like everybody in the family being an unreliable narrator like everybody even though they all share a story everybody in a household is like telling a story in like a completely different way like they touch in some places but they're like it's just going to be inevitably different stories like within a household. So I was like, what does it look like to have somebody who has like no stakes in what's going on for the most part to view a moment, like a pinpointed moment in time and how they are seeing it versus how Sammy is relaying that to us. And that felt significant to me because I think Sammy has this way in which many of us do of being like, this is obviously what's happening around me right now. And then in reality, maybe how a stranger in a pinpointed moment in time sees it like maybe sometimes the same but maybe sees it completely differently like it's not the same kind of thing um so it felt important to be like this is also going to give us like a little bit of like an insight into how like Sammy is like not wrong but like maybe the mm. the ways in which like the truth stretches around what's happening inside of a household yeah I really love those moments because too yeah, they're like an outside glimpse of like what actually maybe happened by an impartial party, but also they go deeper, right? You even like get a little bit into the heads of those characters and what that interaction that they saw in this family made them think of in their own lives. So they were really interesting little touchstones to see. Um, all right, we have time for one more question and I'm going to ask the question that I wanted to ask you because <laughs> I just love that. But so on page 75, you have this really amazing moment where Sammy and Monica realize that they like fucked the same person. They call her like the ear girl, right? And it's like, queers really are part of one big flow chart after all. So my question to you <laughs> were, what are some of your favorite lesbian tropes? And what are ones that you wish you could like light on fire and burn to the ground? Oh man. I mean, I think they're connected. <laughs> so Right, like, because I think that the most fun for me, like, even in writing this book was like, because the stuff that's like, the most annoying to me is also the most interesting for me to unpack, right? Mm -hmm. So like, right when we talk about like, the L word, or like how people like really have internalized like the kind of language of that, like even at the time, right? Because there wasn't anything else, like people yeah. have like if someone is like a Shane or like a Bet or a Tina or somebody like, or like, God forbid, a Jenny, like, God it's forbid. like, it's like, right, like people asking those kinds of things. But because there's sort of also like the idea of, right, like you hauling and like, right, like the turkey baster jokes that everybody says, which feels like very interesting and in keeping with stuff. It's like um, a way in which, but I don't want to like, completely do away with those kinks because I think like the idea of like we're if we're not examining them then we're doing ourselves a disservice yeah. like we're not like unpacking like what what why it sits there or why it's part of like our like cultural history of queerness yeah. right? like that kind of like messy um way in which it's like okay like what is this actually like I was thinking a lot um a while back about like uh the ways in which like social media like serves as this way for like queer people to like showcase like the quote unquote like u-hauling of things right where it's like here's a way in which like i can document like this actual like way in which i'm with a significant other and we can facilitate even quicker the ways in which like we can be together right like oh now we're like we're in a relationship and we can document it on like a website like right like people like like in like in terms of Facebook like we're in a relationship or like oh now we like like lesbians that have like Instagram accounts together where they like share the account and then they break the account yeah who gets the Instagram account like that kind of thing and those are like fascinating to me because the other side of that is like like the idea that like queer people can have visibility, right? Where it's like, oh, there's like a, there's a visibility now where people can see us. Or like, if we're looking at like TikTok, like there's all these like lesbians and like their TikTok relationships that like have like these like accounts that have like 
millions of followers and it's like you kind of look at them and you're like oh this is like so what's happening here but then you're also like oh my god it's like people are like thrilled to be seeing it so like there's like ways in which I like am very invested in like parsing that maybe that's me as a writer but also just probably just me as a messy person that I'm like very interested in the ways that which like queer culture like cultivates like it's like extreme weird messiness and like how like what is actually happening with that like what's like the kind of underlying thing in the narrative and like why we really feel like we want it um and I don't know I like all of it most of, m right now I'm very interested in the TikTok lesbians because there's so many different yeah. stuff <laughs> it made me you know it made me think of um I don't know if you've read it yet but Maddie Quartz the ex-girlfriend of my ex-girlfriend is yes my girlfriend, and I was just <laughs> week I read that this week <laughs> yes well thank you so much for talking to me about this book and inviting me to like share your celebration class I wish I wish I had something here to to join you uh in I'll spirit. just in spirit though uh, absolutely um uh, thank you both so much. This was such a fun conversation. Um, uh, and thank you for all of you out there who uh, were spending your night with us. Um, seriously, go buy uh, With Teeth and Milk Blood Heat, uh, two wonderful books over on thirdplacebooks.com. Or if you're in the uh, local Seattle area, just come stop by any one of our stores. We have so many in stock um, and we they are ready for you to come pick up. Um, so yeah, other than that, on behalf of the store, uh, please have a wonderful evening and please be well, everyone. Thank you, Don Teal. I love you. <laughs>